But you see then, once we are up against this possibility that the distinction between what we do and what happens to us is obliterated. And therefore we would say with Hindus and Buddhists that if I run into a catastrophe, it is my karma. You see, that means far more than that it is a punishment for something I did wrong in the past. That is a legalistic view of karma. But a naturalistic or organic view of karma is in fact that what happens to me is what I do. And that in a certain sense, uh, I want what happens to me. We can use want, notice how we use this word. It means to desire and it means to lack or to need. We say to somebody, you're wanting, you're deficient in something that you need. So it's rather alarming, really, when you consider it, that uh, you always get what you want, invariably even though you may think that it's entirely opposed to your wishes. But if it's your karma, everything that happens to you, put it in another way, everything that comes to you is a return to you of what goes out of you. Yes, obviously, that's absurd. If you confine the definition of yourself to your voluntary conscious behavior. That's a ridiculous definition of oneself. Oneself, by a, any, any stretch of the imagination, must involve far more than the conscious and voluntary aspects of our behavior. And if we see that it involves intimately and inescapably the behavior of what we call the other, the not-self, the environment, and see that these two are moving together like the two sides of the snake when it swims, then you get a very curious feeling. You have to be careful of it. If you've got a Western background. Because, and this is what happens to a lot of people who play around with psychedelic chemicals. There are many, many cases of inflation among these people. That is to say, when you get this sensation that the two sides of the world, the inside and the outside, are moving together, you may think, I am ruling it. I am God in the Western sense of the word. Therefore, your ego, instead of being, as it were, integrated and uh, transcended with all this process, merely assumes vast dimensions, has megalomania, is blown up by the mystical experience. And so you get the holier-than-thou people going around who seem to think that they're above all human conventions and uh, have no obligations to anyone or anything because they're divine and they can do as they damn please. That what they haven't realized is that doing as you will isn't a new kind of behavior that you suddenly put on and say, from now on I'm going to go around doing as I will. You have to realize first that that's what you've always been doing. And you can look at this from a very simple point of view. It's not a complete point of view. But you can say, well now what about the people who, who did good and who did the things that they didn't want to do? You know, everybody's mother said to us, darling, sometimes we have to do things we don't like. Well, what about that? Well, you can always say, the kid obeyed the mother and did the thing that it didn't like because that was the better part of wisdom. In other words, if he'd hadn't done that, something worse would have happened. And we choose the lesser of two evils. And when you find yourself in a situation where you have to choose the lesser of two evils, then you say, I want out of here. And you take the easiest way. You take the line of least resistance. So that's your doing. Now, uh, you, you can pursue that more profoundly when you stop thinking about human behavior as something that responds to the compulsion of an environment. And you can get out of that when you see the behavior of the environment as an essential aspect of you. 
So it isn't as it were the environment starting something, which you are therefore compelled to follow. It's the whole system moving together. So then you get in the state of liberated or mystical consciousness, you very often feel that a hill is lifting you up as you walk up it. The ground seems to heave beneath your feet and up you go. And you get this strange feeling of lightness, of effortlessness, walking on air, never a care, you know. This uh, wonderful sense that there are no obstructions anywhere. There's nothing as it were banging you and making you do that. It all flows together. And that's a very common sense. That's, you are actually, uh, in, in that state of consciousness, you are perceiving the goings on, uh, the Tao, the course of nature, in the way it's happening. But in the ordinary way, you've been conditioned to resist it, to fight it, and to use those sensations of resistance to create a sensory basis for what you describe as the ego. The ego, in practice, is a sense of strain. When you are aware of I, you are aware of a dis basic discomfort, which is located basically between the eyes, somewhere in here, a sort of tightness. Also, it's in other centers too, it's uh, in the solar plexus, and uh, there are various physical centers, in other words, where this constant tension or resistance against it is going on. And that's what you feel when you talk about I. When that tension ceases, you discover immediately that the separate ego has disappeared. And that what I refers to is simply the total panorama of experience, everything that's happening. That's I. And I not, obviously I don't know all of it because I can't inspect all of it with my radar, with my conscious attention. That would be a ridiculous undertaking, to know everything in that sense. We know it in a much better way, as we know how to grow hair and open and close our hands. So, this point of view can be understood if we clarify the initial problems we have about it. And I suppose the first problem is, if we accept the notion that everything that happens to us is our own karma, our own doing, then we have to be very careful of, shall we say, the devil of omnipotence, of inflation, of uh, feeling that your ego is what is in control of all this. And the second thing is, if you think then that everything that happens to everybody is what they really want to happen, then you can absolve yourself from any qualms about being unkind to someone because you could say, well, the unkindness I did you was what you really wanted, wasn't it? You know that business about <laughs> the responsibility of the person who gets murdered for getting murdered? Uh, there is a curious sense in which a lot of people go around looking for trouble. Uh, Freud po points, pointed out quite correctly uh, the psychology of accident-prone individuals. They seem to be attracting trouble like lights attract moths and we're all doing that but we manage to remain unconscious of it so that we can praise and blame and play the game which says that's not my fault that's your fault and so we go around apportioning faults to everybody because if we're going to apportion praise for what the good things people do, you can't make praise mean anything unless you also go around blaming. Praise and blame go together. Supposing everybody was acting in a praiseworthy way, and we praised everybody for everything, they'd get tired of it. They wouldn't even notice it anymore. So, so long as you're going to get a kick out of being praised, you've got to go around blaming too. It's very simple. But if you see the folly of that, that praising and blaming are just <laughs> creating each other, then you don't praise and you don't blame. You just dig the whole thing. And that's why 
when we encounter very great sages, you never hear them blame people and they very rarely praise anyone. You try to start gossip in the presence of such a person and you make a derogatory comment about someone. It's as if you had thrown a rock into a well and heard no splash. And a funny feeling. Because that you get no response. You get no agreement. And uh, if you praise somebody, there's also likely nothing to be said, except perhaps some remark that, of course, you're praising the beloved in all its manifestations. And this, this disconcerts some people terribly. I've always noticed that real sages never gossip, never criticize persons. And uh, because they understand so well the French saying, tout comprend, c'est tout pardonné, to understand all is to forgive all, uh, is so true if you are experienced in just the ordinary way of dealing with human problems. If you've been a counselor or psychotherapist or minister or anything like that, you very soon get to realize how vastly complicated people are and to see that they really are in the messes they're in, not because of anything, <laughs> but that's the way it is. And you stop blaming people, and because you don't blame people, you have open ears and people come and see seek your advice. Because they don't want to come to someone who's a counselor who will bawl them out. It's like dentists who simply accept the fact that people really don't take care of their teeth and realize that the job of a dentist is precisely to look after people who can't be bothered to take care of their teeth. That's why he's in business. <laughs> so a good dentist doesn't bawl his patients out because they didn't do this, that and the other. Just accept it. Same with doctors. They know perfectly well that nobody's going to live by the rules of health. And they're very vague as to what they are. <laughs> you know, there's every kind of theory about how you ought to live and what is healthy, but they change in fashion. And uh, you, you ought to eat this kind of diet in 1921. But by the time it's 1930, they've changed their ideas altogether. And by the time it's 1960, it's back again to a mixture between 1921 and 1894. Something like that. You see, it's always changing. So um, while the rules are not so... You see, if, if they were all absurd, it would be easy. <laughs> but they're not all absurd. There's some truth in it always. But nobody's ever quite sure. So the function of healers and doctors and so on is just to, uh, to do what can be done to stop the mess getting too messy. And they must accept it as that. That's their job. If I were healthy, you say to the doctor, I wouldn't need you. So you're in business. Now, what about it then? Uh, we have difficulty in seeing this mutuality of our relationship to the rest of the world because it's contrary to common sense, contrary to the way we've been brought up. And therefore we have a, what I would call an initial intellectual block to understanding it quite apart from any emotional blocks or anything of that kind. But obviously, we must overcome that intellectual block if we're going to go any further and actually realize and feel this way of life's working and this relationship between what you do and what happens to you. <laughs>